plan for. We ask you, Father God, that you'll guide me, you'll guide us, you'll open our ears, open our spiritual eyes to hear from your word, that your word will come alive and will feed us, that we will be challenged, Lord God, never condemned by the enemy, but absolutely repentant and convicted by the Holy Spirit for what you've called us to do. As you've changed up what I wanted to say, Lord God, I ask you, Lord, that you'll guide me personally as I submit to you, Lord. We pray your Holy Spirit being in this place, that you will be active, as Pastor said, in each and every person in this house, that they will hear from you, that they will grow in you, and that your work will be completed in them through the Lord Jesus Christ. In his mighty, precious, and powerful name we pray. Amen. Today is the first Sunday of the month, and in churches across this land and in other places around the world, people bring forth a new word, a new vision for the church, a new plan, a way to rally their people together, and to tell them what God has done and what God's saying for them to do. I've grown up in a church that way for every year. Pastor Giles, he would say, this is what the Lord's going to do this year. And you need to be in connection with that. You need to be active. You need to be challenged to serve the Lord and be active in what God is saying to us. And I am not against that at all. I think God gives churches vision. He gave us our vision. Um, He gives us a leading and he gives us a guidance of things to do. But you know, there comes a time that you have to set back. The way I approach studies and the way I approach learning is sometimes you got to sit back and wonder if you got the basics done before you move on to the next thing sometimes you have to wonder whether you really got the basics down before you move on to the next bright and shiny thing Um, being part of different organizations and different groups as many of you have been you'll find out that many times you haven't accomplished near as much as what you wanted to before you move on to the next thing who can relate to that in 2018 who looks back at year after year of plans, um, gym memberships that you should never have got, um, books that you bought that sat on the shelf, broken hearts from broken issues, things that have passed that never got healed, and I think that's something I want to visit with you today in a somewhat continuation of brokenness. We have to be broken before God. That's been our series. That's what we were talking about. I initiated the series with the study of Psalms chapter 51, where King David lays out true repentance. It shows his heart as the king who has a man after God's own heart, but yet jacked up so bad that he become a murderer and an adulterer. He really, really messed up. But you know what he knew to do? He knew what it was to repent. When the prophet came before him, the prophet Nathan, and he said, let me tell you a story, king, about this man who had all these sheep, but he went and stole a sheep that belonged to another man. And the king said, that man should die for what he did. And the prophet said, you're that man. Now, King David wasn't the perfect man as none of us are, but he was quick to repent. He immediately repented. We can go back previous chapters and look at the difference between that and King Saul, who was not a man of repentance, not a man after God's own heart. And he just danced around the subject when he messed up. He would not consent. He would not acknowledge. He would always change it up and turn it around and put a spin on it. And he wouldn't get right with God. He just wouldn't get right with God. He wouldn't do what he needed to do to be made right with God. Fast forward to something that's somewhat different, but very similar in another way. If you want to look what happened with the dying of our Lord Jesus, how he was betrayed... Everybody knows who betrayed him, Judas Iscariot. You know who else betrayed him? Peter. But what happened when Jesus confronted Peter and brought his presence to Peter? Peter repented. He made himself right. Judas never had the heart of repentance. He never had a heart to repent. We see these people that all the provisions of the Lord is available to us. God is no respecter of men. He's got all the forgiveness and all the healing. As Pastor Dwayne talked about, that 103rd Psalm is one of my favorite psalms. Will you pull that up for me while I talk? Psalms 103. 
all that God has done is available. Now what we have to do is grab a hold of it. We have to take it. And our lives are always going to be marked by mistakes, issues that never got fixed. But I really believe in modern America today that we're not growing in many ways that we should. I don't think it's just... I know it's not... There's things great happening at Oasis. I'm so excited. You don't understand the excitement I see to see that you come to serve God today and to seek Him and to worship with us. I'm, I'm excited and I love you and I'm not being negative. But I want to tell you honestly... Many of us won't step out in the things that God has for us because we don't have a maturity and an understanding of God and what God has done. And it's not Oasis alone. It's all over. It's all over America. But the way we teach the gospel in so many of our ways is that you say this prayer and you're right with God. Well, you know what you've done? You've just began a walk with God that just goes on and on and on. He's going to challenge you. He's going to break you down. He's going to build you up after he breaks you down and make you something totally different than you think you are. I mean, listen to the Psalm of David. A Psalm of David, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities. Either it's the word of God or it's not. Either it's all or it's none. Either it's all or it's none, family. This is the God we have. All of your iniquities. Who heals all of your diseases. Who redeems your life from destruction and who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. This morning in this, this desire to go into brokenness, I wanted to talk about calling upon the name of the Lord, which is something that Pastor Dwayne alluded to, something we've been studying and discussing on Wednesday nights, is calling upon the name of the Lord. The Bible teaches that anybody who understands the Roman road to salvation, which many churches teach and preach about being saved and being right with God, you have to call upon the Lord. In the middle of your brokenness, in the middle of your sin, you call upon the Lord. And that doesn't just happen and stop. It's a lifestyle for a Christian. There's power available to us when we call upon the Lord when we're not understanding what we're reading when we don't understand why we're going through an issue, when someone is sick, we're calling upon his name. And you're actually, verbally, the word teaches us, there's nothing wrong with praying to yourself, but we are taught in the word to pray audibly. Out loud, cry to him. Speak to him. It does something. It does something to speak out loud and to call upon the name of the Lord. Well, I want to call upon the Lord, and I wanted to do this, and I, and I got ready to study this, but I felt like I should go another direction in a sense, before we get to calling upon the Lord. Who are we calling upon? Before you get to calling upon Him, do you really believe Him? Do you really believe He's the God that does all those things? That's the place to camp out, family. You've got to camp out on who God is. That's the Christian walk. The Christian walk is camping out on who He is and what He has done and discovering the riches of of what we have in Christ Jesus. We have to understand who he is. We have to, as a people, before, and I'm not saying God doesn't have a vision for this year, because he does. He's got vision. He's going to speak to your heart. He's going to bring all kinds of things into your life in 2018, I pray and believe. He is poised and ready to bless you. But you know what we have to do? We've got to build a foundation first. And sometimes you've got to go back. Pastor Dwayne likes to talk the analogy from playing, playing, playing football that you've got to go back to the basics, and you've got to camp on them. You've got to stay on them. You've got to work on those basics. You cannot work too hard on the basics. You can't because they get that foundation to build upon. And that's what the church needs to do. Because the fact is, if we know who he is and what he has done, then we can call on him. What good does it do to call on him if you really don't believe he's going to answer you? What good is it going to do if you don't believe he's the God who does all those things? You personally in your life may have diseases. 
you personally in your life have iniquities. Almost all of us have iniquities. I believe the Lord will take those out of us and deliver us from them. But most of us stay with our iniquities. We, we stay with those. We keep those. But he wants to remove them. But do you believe he can take all of them? Do you believe he can change your heart? Do you believe that he can change your life? See, it all comes back to him. Everybody's into theology, whether you believe it or not, which is the study of God. Either you've studied him to the point that you're satisfied and you're like, this is all I know about him, this is all I need with him, this is all I really need, I drop it and I move on. Or you're someone who may be over here studying and trying to understand more about who he is because when you understand who he is, then it changes your life. There's a story, and it's just a joke real quick, of a little girl in the classroom who is painting. A kindergarten teacher was observing her classroom of children when they were drawing, and she occasionally walked by to see each child's artwork, and as she went by one little girl who was working diligent, she asked her what she was drawing. The little girl said, I'm drawing God, and the teacher Paul said, well, if no one really knows what God looks like, and without missing a beat or looking up from her drawing, the little girl, little girl replied, they will in a minute. They will in a minute. I will show you what God looks like. You know, we all think we know about God, and to be honest with you, the Christian walk is about discovering more about who he is and less about who we are, more about what he has done. As a matter of fact, when we discover more about him, then we realize how much we need him and how holy he is and how loving and perfect he is and how we are not that way. Well, when the thing that happens when you do this sort of thing, the thing I'm getting at is you're discovering God. So I did this with my kids and I want to do it with you. I want you to tell me, define God for me. Will I have any taste? Probably not. Will you pull that? Do you have that where you can project that in the notes that I had for you? Okay. I'm going to read this to you. Anyone want to give me an example of God? Can you define God real quick? Simple definition? Love? How, how about a Merriam-Webster definition from people who don't aren't into the Christian theology? Let's do that, okay? The supreme or ultimate reality. The supreme or ultimate reality. God is a reality beyond us. How about the being perfect in power, wisdom, and goodness? The being perfect in power, wisdom, and goodness who is worshipped as creator and ruler of the universe. He is worshipped as creator and ruler of the universe. So I asked my kids this question. I asked you this question. If we want to be basic as we begin 2018. God is all those things, right? Whether you believe it or not. That's what the Bible teaches. God is beyond us. He is greater than us. He has many things that we are not. And they are all good. These all things fit in line that I've read you with this definition with the Bible. These all fit in line with the Bible, these definitions. If God is good and powerful and the ruler of the universe and the Bible says it's that way, what's our need as a Christian? As a follower of this God, as a... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define myself here if I don't quit. I'm going to answer my own question if I don't be easy here. How do we show He's our God? How do we show he's our God? Anybody want to answer that? Worship him? Actually, that's what it actually says. That's what I'm getting at is worship. Thank you. It says here, the definition of God is the being perfect in power, wisdom, and goodness who is worshipped as creator and ruler of the universe. So we're called to worship him. So this really, really for me fits in line with the whole 2018 before we cast a vision and we go crazy and we say, hey, God wants to do these things. Let's get a basic, basic foundation of if he's God, 
we have to be connected to him in some way. It says here in Merriam-Webster, the way we're connected with him, showing he's our God, is we worship him. We worship him. Can anyone define for me what worship is? Merriam-Webster defines it as to honor or reverence a divine being or superpower. To honor or reverence. Point two definition, to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. To regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, and devotion. Anybody Christian in here who could tell me what Jesus said? What does he want? What's our first point of our vision that Pastor said this morning? Love. God is love. God wants love. The Christian God wants love. And how would you define love? I'm not going to do textbook definition on that. How would you define love? Love is your time. Love is your focus. Jesus says in Matthew 14, 15, if you love me, you keep my commandments, right? So love is to adore, to honor, to respect, to obey. The thing I'm getting at is if we call ourselves Christian in America today with the convenient Christianity we have where people belong to a church and may attend some, the statistics are crippling for the church in America today. The statistics are crippling very few who consider themselves Christian attend church on a regular basis or attend at all. The, small, the number of people who give is flabbergastingly low. I could do the statistics, but I'm going to keep, try to keep going for sake of time. Of those who give, the ones who actually give in the biblical way of tithe is drastically low. It, so you, you have a tiny amount of people who even attend. Of those who attend, only a small part even give. And of those who give, hardly any of them give a tithe and a biblically taught traditional Christian understanding of the Bible way to give. And of course, giving to the church isn't just tithing money. Giving the church is your prayers, your time, your help. I mean, the church isn't just a building, the church is people. So when God puts on your heart to pray for someone, make the phone call, write the letter, say a prayer for them, go by their house. Those are things the church is called to do. Those are other ways you can give into the church besides actually giving money into it. But what I'm saying is, in America today, for most of us who are Christians today, not in just Oasis, but any church, we really don't regard him as God. Because we don't give him this reverence that's extravagant. We don't give him an honor where we love on him and talk with him and give him from ourselves, give to him from ourselves. But you know what most of us are ready for when we come on a Sunday morning, the first Sunday in a lot of churches? We're ready for that vision about what God's going to do. Just being real, you know, I don't mean to be negative. Sorry, but I'm just being real. I mean, you know, love is honest. I say that all the time to my kids. And I hope if you love me, you can tell me the truth in love too. Yet for most of us, we don't have a maturity that we should have in our relationship with God. And to me, it's scary. As a pastor, and as someone who was before I was a pastor, it was scary for me. I hope it's scary for you that most people really don't trust God. They don't understand who God is and what He has done. And when they read the Word of God, like we read a while ago, it doesn't settle in their heart that He's the God who can do all those things. And He's waiting and He's poised and He's ready to do those things if you will begin to do things His way. If the church was understanding the things of God, let's look at a couple other things that God has done that's just amazing. Um... Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll read six, six verses of Ephesians chapter 2. And I want you to think about what God has done for you and then what you give back to God. Before you launch another vision and another exciting thing, which 
I'm all for those churches. I'm sorry, I'm not being negative. If you subscribe, I'm going to tune in later today to a pastor I respect and love who's got vision for the church. And I think he has vision for the church in America, not just for his church, but for the church abroad and what God wants to do and what God's moving, moving and doing in the church. I'm, I'm not being negative against those things, okay? I really believe that God brings vision and things are go in sequence and in time. But for us this morning, I just want to be real with you for a minute and ask us, do we really know what God has done? Is He really our God? Are we ready for this? Are we ready to move on? So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all were once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the mind and of the excuse me, of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Don't go forward. What has God done? Do you believe it's the word of God? Do you believe that you were dead in your sins, but now you're alive in Christ. If the church gets a hold of these things and it really makes difference to you in your heart and you believe it, it'll change your life. It will change our lives. We have to believe these things before we can go into the teaching that I wanted to, I mean, about calling on the Lord. You have to believe in who He is before you're ever going to call on Him. You know, otherwise, it's just going through the motion you know what that is that's religiosity that's religion religion's going through motions relationship is dependence amen relationship is dependence i need you i'm dependent upon you you are my hope you're all i have i was dead but now i'm alive now what can i do for you what can i do for you if the church in America really believes that God has made them alive from the dead, as the Word of God says He has, and if you call yourself a Christian, if He's really did these things for us, why aren't we giving? I mean, it's easy for me to say this because, you know what? I am so thankful for my pastor brothers up here on this pastoral staff. We have chosen to take no wages. So that means I can talk about money and nobody should get offended at me, I hope. Because it's not going in my pocket, you know what I mean? I've, I've, I'm blessed to have brothers and sisters in here who have given me money. You know, just, and it's, it's been randomness. They've given me some money, and that's a blessing, and I thank them, and they know who they are, and I love them for it. And I'm not on a pity party either, because God has blessed me, and I'm doing great. And I'm excited as much as ever in my life about what God is doing. I am so excited about what He's doing. But you know what? You've got to be real and speak the truth sometimes. And if I don't have wages, it gives me the ability to say to you, you need to tithe. And if you can't tithe, you need to give what the Lord tells you to give. If you feel that that's not right, or if you somehow read the word and you think that you need to give something, if you need to give time, you need to give time to the Lord. And it doesn't have to be Oasis Church. If you don't belong here and you're visiting, or if you really will give somewhere else, give to God wherever the Lord's leading you to give. But I'm saying if God has really did things for you, your life should be different. But for the church, you cannot see that we're much different than the world. Our divorce rates are the same. Our discussion and our talk in the workplace is the same as the world. Most of us go and do the same, same things as the world. We've got to be in and of the world, but be separate from it. It's a balance that only the Holy Spirit can do in our lives, right? Only the Holy Spirit can do those things. And I'm not here telling you that I'm perfect. God knows my brothers and sisters, my beautiful wife's here to tell you that I'm not perfect. I'm not playing that. But what I'm saying to you is we should have a desire 
that brings us together to serve God and with passion because of what He has done for us. And the church is not at that point. And I think that God's doing it. I believe, and you know what? If we do get right, guess who's done it? It's really Him through us. It's Him convicting us and breaking us down, but showing us the way, right? He got his, we've got to do things different than we do. You know, it's, it's all across this land that, com, that Christianity is a confession and a membership. Church is a building instead of a group of people that we care about. If we spend more time on the building than we do on people, we've got a problem. If we spend more time spending money on ourselves than on the kingdom of God, we've got a problem. If we spend more time pleasing ourselves from the TV to the internet to the Facebook to bowling to whatever your thing is, but you spend no time serving the Lord and giving and tithing into the kingdom of God, we got a problem. And it's rampant. It's everywhere. And we all, I tell you first up, man, I have been outside of the will of God. I have been in the church before, a long time ago, not tithing. I have tithed the Lord since I was 18 years old. I praise God for that. And you know what? Some people are in a position that they're trying to figure out how to get that way. I'm not condemning you. I'm not trying to look down on you. I'm not saying that I'm better than you, but I'm saying I praise God that he's helped me do that. That's what that means from my heart, okay? And God wants to help you give into the church. And the church is not just the building. It's the kingdom of God. And as you go out today, and I'll tell you people that I respect that have vision and Pastor Dwayne may come back next week and he says, man, this is the thing the Lord gave me. I'm with it, man. I'm with the vision for 2018 because God does those things. But you've got to come back and ask yourself, what good is another thing to do if you haven't already done what you should have done? You know what I mean? What good does it do for us to come in here? You know how bad it is in the church? And I'm telling you this with a broken heart. People come into the church and leave and go live sinful lifestyles and never get convicted. You know what? That's on our back. That's on our back, not just mine. That's on our back. It's on our back that the church isn't excited at every building and every church congregation in America who claims that Jesus is their Lord. It's on their back that people come into the church hungry and leave hungry. They come in the church in need and leave in need they come to the church living in sin and leave to go live in sin and don't get the phone calls and don't get the messages that I love you, where'd you go? Hey, come on back. Did you need something? Where you been? Most of the church, not just Oasis, but any church, sees themselves as coming in and going through the motions, which is religiosity, instead of coming in and going through relationship. Because you've got to have a relationship with God and relationship with each other. We've got to be connected to the Lord and to each other. We are, 1 Peter chapter 2, we are a kingdom of priests. Now, if you know, and I want to bring this up for a moment, that Jesus is the great high priest, right? We know that because it says it in that same book. We know that the Bible says in this Old Testament passages of the example of the tabernacle that was temporary, it was inferior, it taught us about God, and it served a purpose for a time until the greater thing came, which was the body of the blood of Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of Christ. He has made the way for all the Old Testament design of the temple, which was an example to be laid aside because in heaven is the true tabernacle where God dwells, and Jesus is the great high priest in the Holy of Holies, ministering to the Lord God. The Lord Jesus is ministering to the Lord God in the Holy of Holies. And guess who's supposed to be not in the Holy of Holies? We're not in heaven, but we're in the holy place, spiritually seated with Christ, Ephesians chapter 2. We are spiritually seated with Christ, ministering to the people. We get saved and become ministers of the gospel of Christ. To minister. Jesus is ministering over here, and we are part of his body on the backside of him, ministering to the world the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our job if we consider ourselves a Christian, if we grow and mature in the faith, if we become a true disciple of Christ. That is what we're called to do, is minister the gospel to the world. But you know what most of us today in, in our setting, in our time and age, in our culture here, 
we come in and sit down in the pew and we never get healed enough to believe that God is able to help us minister to people. We never believe that we're able, to, because we never study the Word hardly. Hardly anyone spends an hour in the Word. Hardly any of us study the Word and grow in the Word and mature in the Word. And because we don't do those things, we never get to the point that we feel that we're able to minister the love of Christ. I am not going to end on a song. I'm going to end quietly and pray. And we're going to have a potluck. If you came today and you did not bring the potluck, we want you to stay with us and eat. We want to fellowship with you and love on you. Some of you know, knew and brought food, and some of you didn't know because you didn't hear the announcement. Or Please hang out. Don't leave. Come over and have something to eat with us. You don't have to leave unless you have plans. But I'm going to pray. I think there's times that you just have to pray quietly. You have to think about the reality of things. And there's no, there's no need for song and dance for a moment. You just need to come before God and you just need to say, Lord, this man stands up here and runs his mouth saying that some people are not the place they need to be and I don't want to be in that place. Search my heart let me know if it's me. Father God, I love you and I thank you for these people. There's no one in this house and in this place, there's no one on Facebook and out on the Ethernet that hears my voice that you don't love and you don't have a way to save them. There's no one that doesn't have a calling on their life to serve you and to be part of the church of Christ. There's no one who is too far separated that the blood of the Lamb, the precious, powerful blood of Jesus will not deliver them and make them holy, perfect in Christ to the point that they can go to heaven and be with you forever. There is no need in Christ that is not available if they will simply call upon the name of the Lord. But before we call on you, Father, we have to mature in you. We have to understand that we're calling upon a God who is willing and able, fully all-powerful to do these things, but we have to trust you and we have to believe it. And we ask you, Father God, that you will give us repentance, that you will break our hearts in whatever way you desire that you will make us your people who are broken and dependent upon you, that we call upon your name and that we mature in you, Father God. That we call upon your name so that you will answer our prayers in Jesus' name. I ask you, Father, that you will bless these people as they go out of here this week. That they will be excited about the new year, that you will bring them to them dreams and visions, that you will bring to them an understanding of the word of God, that is beyond anything they've ever read in it before, beyond their understanding at this point, that they will grow in Christ, that they will become disciples, not church members, but disciples of Christ, because that's what matters. That you will help the church in this town and in this land, the church of Christ around the world mature, where we truly believe who you are, and we believe the word of God, and we want to give from our heart into your kingdom. We want to tithe. We want to help. We want to work. We want to love. We want to call. We want to be in the word. Please mature us, Father God, so that when we do receive the next assignment, we've accomplished the first. We've got it down enough that we can move on in, our, in the class. We can move on to the next subject, the next book. We ask you, Father God, to develop us here at Oasis and every church in Watonga and around the land in America that you will cause the church to rise up and be the church. Not just to be here on a Sunday, but then to go home and not mature in the Word. Let them be hungry for what they hear. Let them understand it and grow in it, Father God. Only you can do these things by your grace and your power and your mercy, Father God. Only you can do these things. Father, we praise you and we love you for all that you've done. And we know, Father, that it's, it's something, it's a lifetime of staying in the Word, discovering who you are. It takes a lifetime to discover. And when we leave and depart this world in hopefully our old age, we will have only touched the surface of what Christ has done. But, Father, let us at least get the surface down. Let us at least get down the basics, Father so that people are willing and ready to lead others to Christ. If most people, Father, encounter someone who does not accept Christ, they don't even know how to lead them 
and a centered prayer. So we ask you, Father, to make us students of your word, to make us hungry, to mature us in our dependency upon, upon you, that we can say with the surety that you are our God. Not the television, not the internet, not the book, not the next vacay that's coming up that we got our mind set on. You are our God. You are the center of our hearts and our universe, Father. That's what we ask. And we ask you, Father, that you will spread that throughout the land in Jesus' name. I love you, Father, and thank you for this time. And I pray that you'll cause what I've said to be profitable. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Yeehaw. Is Hannah in here? She's not. Okay. I love you guys, and I thank you for worshiping with us today. And I hope that you're going to hang out and talk with us for a while. It's great to see a big crowd today. I really did not anticipate this big of a crowd. This is great. I love you guys, and thank you for coming. Have a blessed, blessed week. It's okay. I'll talk to you in a minute. If you do need prayer, 